This morning we will be in Genesis 9, uh, verses 8 through 17. I've termed this lesson God's Covenant, and that's to emphasize the unilateral nature of the covenant. It's from God, and it depends only upon Him for its sustainment, for its execution, for its effectiveness. It's often called the Noahic Covenant, but as we'll see, the covenant itself was made with more than Noah. And it was given through more than Noah. So this covenant stands as a promise to all creatures on the, on the earth. And everybody and every creature depends on this covenant for the many blessings, mercies anew that we heard in that hymn. Seed time and harvest, Scripture tells us, summer and winter, heat and cold, day and night. These are things that happen because God has promised that until the end of the age, we all will benefit from these kindnesses that he's bestowed upon us. I want to first look at verses 8 through 11 in Genesis 9. Verse 8, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons, saying, his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth." God had promised a covenant back in chapter 6 and verse 18 where he said, it starts in verse 17, Behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh. He promised this before the flood. After the flood, he formalizes it. This is the first formal defined covenant in Scripture, and it's unconditional. It's an unconditional covenant decreed by God to apply to certain people and creatures. Throughout Scripture, specifics may vary, but in every covenant given by God, He's the one who determines with whom the covenant is made. God decrees who the party is, whether it's a covenant of works or whether it's a covenant of grace. Previously, God had spoken to Noah, told him to get on the boat, the ark, told him to get off the ark. Now he speaks to Noah and his sons, and I think it's important to recognize this. These, this was in a culture in which the men were the leaders of the family. We were supposed to live in that same type of culture. Men were supposed to be the leaders of the family. It was a little more formalized back in this time. And he's speaking to these men who spent time on the ark. And through these four men, this covenant of Noah, this Noahic covenant is given. God goes on to declare that these flood survivors, the men and their wives and their descendants and every creature that was on the ark are parties to the covenant. This covenant was made with everybody and everything that was on the ark and their progeny. Now, in verse 9, the New King James says, I will establish my covenant with you. And it's interesting, and this is a, a theological rabbit trail here. The word, the Hebrew word behind the, the, the English word establish is not the same word used elsewhere like in chapter 15 where God makes a covenant or cuts a covenant. Different word in Hebrew, different word in English. Now, some translations use the word confirm in Genesis 9 verse 9. And books have been written 
using confirm to argue that the covenant with Noah is a renewal of the covenant with Adam, not a new covenant. Now, much of the dominion language is the same between Adam and Noah. Right? Take dominion over the earth, a different basis for it. Fear and dread in this covenant we saw earlier. There's a lot of differences, though, between the covenant with Adam and the covenant of Noah. And even if the word confirm is the best translation, and I don't think it is, it makes sense that Yahweh is building on what he told Noah in chapter 8, verses 15 and 17. And if you remember that, God spoke to Noah and said, go out of the ark, you and your wives and your sons and your sons' wives, and bring everything with you and all the birds and the cattle. And Noah went out and the sons' wives with him. And he's commanding them to go out so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. That's the basis of the covenant that he's establishing with these people. The vast majority of English Bibles from different manuscript families use the word establish. And I think this fits what God is describing to us here better than the word confirm. So, just so you know that. John Gill said of this covenant that it's not the covenant of grace in Christ, but a preservation of the creatures in common, a promise that they shall not be destroyed anymore by flood. This covenant's an encouragement to those who have gone through this global catastrophe that they would be able to multiply and to fill the earth. As I mentioned last week, we have a hard time maybe relating to this, but they had just seen millions, they, how much they knew we don't know, but millions of people were destroyed from the planet. Countless numbers of creatures had been wiped off the face of the earth. Can you imagine going through that type of destruction? We read in the news tens of thousands of people killed here and there and 19 people killed in the hurricane in Florida. Eight people out of all of the millions that were on the earth left. You must have confidence in the God who caused that when he says peace. If you don't trust in the one who can calm the storm, the one who caused the storm, you can't have peace. So these, these animals, we were driving, driving here this morning and I was looking at cows. They don't have a care in the world. They're, they're, they've benefited from the recent rains and the grass is tender and they're chowing down. God has provided for them and they don't even know it. We know it. Do we trust him? Do we thank him for his provision for us on these things and these things? God repeats something that we saw last week in the first few verses of chapter 9. He says, and he says it twice right here in our text, never again will be, there be a flood to destroy the earth. And this promise that he gave them in the first part of chapter 9 is confirmed and established as a covenant primarily with the humans and the beasts who were on the ark, primarily with them. They were the they were the ones who had gone through the catastrophe. They are the ones who are being encouraged that things are going to be stable now. You can go out and you can multiply. You can have kids. You can take dominion over this. You can fill the earth. But this covenant didn't end with that first generation. It was on the ark. Now, the people that were on the ark, and I mentioned this last week, had no idea how long they were going to be on that ark. When they got off the ark, the one who shut them into the ark promises precious things to them that I think we tend to take for granted. What God covenants
covenants with his people, what God promises to his people, we ought not take for granted. Jesus said, as he was explaining the covenant to the national Israelites in his day, that you ought not to worry about what you wear and what you eat. And I believe he was alluding to Israel's 40 years in the desert where their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out. And he was telling these first century Jews, you ought not to worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. God provided the manna and the quail. And he said, your father knows that the birds have need of such thing and how much more value are you? Therefore, don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, and so forth. We ought to trust God. He cares for the cows. My dog, Sherlock, rejoices when he sees a bag of dog food come through the door because he knows that's where his sustenance comes from. He's that smart. And he's happy when that big 40-pound bag gets lugged through the door. Are we happy when God brings the sun up for a new day, when we are reminded of his mercies are new for another day, and he provides for us physically, he provides for us spiritually, because he's the faithful one. That's the message of the scriptures. He is the faithful one. Let's go on with the rest of our text here, starting at verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Wow. A rainbow. The sign of the covenant, of any covenant, the sign is intended to provoke a unique, easily recognizable reminder of what the covenant was about. This covenant has a rainbow. Nobody but God can make a rainbow appear in the sky. People nowadays take rainbows for granted. It's a slap in the face of God not to thank him for being faithful in his promises in this covenant. It's a slap in the face of God to use the rainbow for things he hadn't ordained it. In Scripture, we see the rainbow used describing the beauty and glory of God. And we see this in three different passages, and I'll, I'll read them to you right quick. In Ezekiel, you know the scene where he's describing the bizarre living creatures that have wheels and eyes that go everywhere and see all things. And what, is, what did he really see? We don't know. But he goes on to say this. Above the firmament over their heads, these creatures' heads, was the likeness of a throne and an appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around it. And from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The rainbow reveals the glory of God in heaven. It's not just a pretty ark with a pot of gold at the end. 
It is a revelation of God to man of who he is. John refers to the rainbow twice in his apocalypse, first describing the glory of God. In uh, chapter 4, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. It sounds like he read Ezekiel. And there was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance like an emerald. And then in Revelation 10, he says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head and his face was like the sun and his feet like the pillars of fire. That's all the scripture has to say about rainbows. Those four passages in Genesis, Ezekiel, in Revelation. What's the rainbow all about? It is about the glory of God evidenced in creation. When we see a rainbow in the sky, we often marvel at the beauty. You see a double rainbow. We've seen pictures of that on the internet recently. Wow, people marvel at that. But do we realize the might, the power, and the glory, and the divine beauty that produced the rainbow and is represented by it? That's the challenge to us as Christians. Don't be satisfied with the mere beauty of the primary colors that the scientists tell us are in the rainbow. Who put it there? Who is he that sets his glory in the sky this way? Ron Crisp pointed out that when the flood came, rain was a major means of the judgment being pronounced on the earth because of man's sin. And there's no record of rain falling before the flood. Some people think there was. Some people think there wasn't. There's no record of it in Scripture. Crisp observed, quote, Imagine then the fear of those coming off the ark or later hearing of the flood would feel every time it rained. To alleviate this fear and as a sign of God's pledge not again to destroy the earth by water, the rainbow was made to act as a sign. The rainbow was a pledge of God's covenant which he made with all men and animals. Let us today explain to our children the meaning of the rainbow, end quote. When the creator gives a covenant sign with promises that he has made in that covenant, we need to pay attention. Those who co-opt the rainbow as a wrapper for sin are shaking their fist at the one who commands the rainbows to appear. They are shaking their fist at the one who will judge all sin and sinners at the end of the age. And something as simple as a rainbow is far more significant than I had ever imagined before I studied this. The Abrahamic covenant has circumcision for its sign. Nobody would want to do that without a good reason, like being in covenant with Yahweh via being related to Abraham by fleshly procreation. That's what that covenant was about. Those who failed to circumcise their young males would be denied access to the Passover meal. Moses was threatened with death for failing to circumcise his son. That's in Exodus 4. One commentator opined that Moses could not lead a people if he would not obey the covenant. And this, this covenant was swallowed up in the Mosaic covenant by the time of Jesus. It was being synonymous with that covenant. If you didn't keep circumcision, you weren't a Jew. And if you're not a Jew, you're not part of that covenant community. Signs are important. The Mosaic covenant had the weekly Sabbath as its sign. When national Israel was properly observing this, they were reminded of their status as God's covenant people, and others were informed that these people and their God were different. The Sabbath set them apart. National Israel had a long track record of not keeping the weekly Sabbath, of being slack in observing most of the law that Yahweh had given them through Moses. God's people not taking care to honor the sign of the covenant they were in 
major cause, major reason God reveals for his chastisement of those people and repeated punishment of them by the worst kind of barbarians that were on the face of the planet in that time. Now, the New Covenant doesn't have any things that are explicitly in Scripture called signs of the covenant. I think the Lord's Supper is the closest thing we have to a sign. When we observe that, we are reminded of our standing in Christ and His promise to make our home with Him. Uh, water baptism is considered by many people also to be a sign of the New Covenant, and it serves much the same purpose as does the Lord's Supper. It reminds us of who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. These are things that signs do, and we ought to be very serious and deliberate in the way we approach these ordinances. God's people in every age and every covenant should be students of the covenant they're in and its sign. God gives us to these so that we would remember him and what he has done for us what he has promised to do, and how faithful he is in doing what he had promised. His mercies are new every day because he is faithful. Henry Law, in his book, The Gospel in Genesis, says this, Here the great depth of God's love are broken up. As the deluge overstopped the highest hills, so this assurance drowns the pinnacles of doubt and hesitation. It places the covenant of Noah in contrast with the covenant of Jesus. God promising to hold back a flood pictures God making oath that he will save to the othermost. The earth safe from watery waste is the church safe from all wrath. But if the former had a pledge impressed on the firmament, much more has the latter a seal of unfading perpetuity, even Jesus, high in the glories of heaven. Thus faith sees the rainbow in the cloud and adores the Savior on the right hand of God. I love it when a man named Law writes about the gospel in the Old Testament. Now, Adam was the head of all humanity in his day, and he had two sons that served as types for the human race. Seth was the godly line. Cain was of the world. Noah, new federal head of all humanity. Everybody else is dead except Noah's family. He had three sons. From Ham's children, you get Nimrod and Babel, Canaan and Assyria, people of the world who would war against the people of God. Noah's other son, Japheth, fathered Elijah, Tarshish, and Magog. Everybody knows Magog, but they don't know Magog. People who grew rich and fat were kind of these folks. Shem was the representative of God's chosen people and a promised seed, giving rise to Abram nine generations later. The safety of the ark wasn't for the sake of all the people on the ark, that the people that Noah fathered. It was for the sake of the promised seed. See, every act of redemption, temporal redemption that happens in Scripture, is for the sake of the promised seed. The book of Ruth is a short divergence, if you will, in this redemptive story that shows a Jewish family leaves the covenant community because of a drought, and they find themselves connected with this Moabite woman, this Gentile, and all the Jewish men die, and the Jewish widow brings this foreigner back into the covenant community, and she gets married to Boaz, and who's the grandchild? David. See, God is always moving to pull people this way and that way, to move events this way and that way, so that the seed would be protected. Redemptive history is all about bringing that promised seed to culmination. 
Everyone, after, everyone that comes after Noah is the beneficiary of Almighty God's kindness and providential care. The covenant in Genesis 9 provides the only goodness that many folks will ever see. Ham and Japheth, representative of those who will not find peace with God. In this age, God provides seed time and harvest so that they might have life, even if only for a season. For those who are in Christ, Shem points us to the promise of God that brings eternal life to those who are called. These two groups of people are a constant presence in this age. While Adam's covenant brought death to all men, Noah's covenant brings a respite, a respite until that great day of judgment when Christ shall come to judge the nations and all men must give an account to their creator. Again, Henry Law says, The book of nature is the penmanship of God. Every line should be a sanctifying lesson. Law imagines Noah as one who might have been traumatized by the flood, kind of like Ron Crisp said. Without God promising not to repeat the flood. And he says that three times. Never again shall flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all the flesh. Three times in our text he says that. Apart from that promise, each cloud threatening rain might bring another life ending flood. Man who doesn't believe in God might have that perception. Law then bids us to, quote, turn to our God. He is glorious in tenderness and pity and compassion and watchful care towards his people. It is his merciful will that they should repose in perfect peace. He, invi he invites them to feed by the still waters of confiding love. He would have the wings of each breeze to flutter over them laden with joy. He would have every shadow to spread the cover of protection. But how will he calm the trembling anxieties of Noah? A word of heaven sent promise might suffice. But he who multiplies to pardon multiplies also to give comfort. His word indeed shall go forth, but it shall go forth sealed and an enduring, ever speaking seal. He will call a new wonder into being. A smiling offspring of the weeping cloud shall tranquilly assure the earth that waters have no more mandate to lay waste. And what is this wonder? An arch cheering and bright embraces the sky on a scroll of very light, there it is inscribed, these storms drop fertility. They break to bless and not to injure. This is the work of God who can change. See, Mother Nature is a fable man brought up, right? There is no such thing as Mother Nature. When the clouds, when the hurricane ravaged the states on the East Coast and is still causing trouble, Mother Nature didn't do that. For reasons we cannot fathom, God clearly says that he calls the clouds to go and drop rain where he says it will go. What we know from his word, he's not going to flood the earth again. Not even anthropomagic global warming is going to flood the earth again because God said it ain't going to happen. Law goes on. He says, how is this wonder framed? Jehovah's works are sublime in their simplicity. The sun looks forth from the opposite skies. Its rays enter the descending drops, the rain falling down, and returning to the eye in broken pencils, paint the rainbow on the illuminated background. Heaven dries up the tears of earth, and the high roof above seems to take up the gospel hymn. Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Thus, the rainbow is more than an evidence of skill and power. It's the brilliant signet on God's preserving arm. It's the golden impress by which he ratifies the covenant that the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Henry Law has written the gospel in the first five books of the Bible, and I would encourage you to look them up. They're freely available on the Internet. Good stuff from this brother. 
The Noahic covenant is the first covenant made with man after the destruction of the world and the emergence of the then new world. It's a new covenant for the new world. Covenant was unconditional and God made, God made promises not dependent on anything from man or from creation. And he spells out who the members of the covenant were. Man had no say so. Just like in the covenant with David, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with Abraham, God says who's included. In this way, Noah's the covenant head of all humanity. The covenant is unilateral. The covenant is with a new world. It is a type and it is a shadow which points to the new covenant, which is the last covenant made with mankind after the flood. This new covenant has Christ, the last Adam, as its federal head. The new covenant is unconditional in that God has acted to redeem a people without regard to anything that man has done or was capable of doing. And just as God chose who would benefit from this covenant in Genesis 9, man has no say so because God has chosen who will benefit from this new covenant that has been established by the death of his son. Just as the judgment of the flood was a type or a shadow pointing to the final day of judgment, so is the covenant of that era a type or shadow of the final covenant God would make with his creatures. I'll give you another quote from Brother Law. He says, In our journey through the wilderness, the horizon is often obscured by storms like these, terrors of conscience, absence of peace, harassing perplexities, crushing burdens or difficulties. But from behind these dusky curtains, the rainbow strides forth in its strength. It is indeed a cheerless day when terrors of conscience pour down pitiless peltings. Specters of past sins start up. A grim array of bygone iniquities burst their tombs. And each terrifies by hideous form. And each points to eternal death as its due. The light of life, the light of life seems excluded by the dread. Can there be hope when sins have been so many and so grievous and against the clearest knowledge and after such tender pardons and such healings of mercy? Wild is this tempest roar, but in the midst, faith can still look upwards and see Jesus with outstretched arms before the throne of God. There is a rainbow on his head and the bright colors right. Father, forgive them. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The darkness vanishes and clear joy returns. Do you believe this? Do you believe that the one who created all things, the one that sustains all things by the word of his power, by the will of his might, do you believe that he can preserve you through the trials, the temporal pains and agonies, the decay, the decay of your body and mind that we all go through? Do you trust him, brothers and sisters? There are days when I don't trust him. But we are called to do so. In life or in death, trust in the one who has gone beyond the veil for you and for me. When I was a kid, there was this brother and sister that were looking out their window on a dark and stormy day and the glass was pelted with water running down the panes. And the sister looks to her brother and says, boy, look at it, rain. What if it floods the whole world? And her brother, who's a bit of a theologian, says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that never again would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Lucy said, you've taken a great load off my mind. Linus replied, sound theology has a way of doing that. Sound theology will be biblical and Christ-focused. Our circumstances can overwhelm us. 
Our mortal lives are fragile and will fail us. I was loading some stuff in our truck last night and we were at our son's house and I was getting out of the truck and our little truck has tie down lugs that stick out from the bed inside the bed and they're made of steel. And when I was walking out of the truck, I banged into that real hard with my left leg right below the knee. And you know what gave? Not the steel. We are fragile of mind. I, I've owned that truck for five years. I know that lug's there. Weak of mind. Weak of body. Our circumstances will tell us all is gloom. We must be reminded that His mercies are new day by day. Lamentations 3 is a wonderful reminder of what that hymn told us. We must see the rising sun as evidence that God is faithful to His promise that while we will have trouble in this world because we are hated by those who are of the world, we should have peace in our souls because Christ has overcome the world. And how do we know that he has overcome the world, brothers and sisters? He was killed. The wrath of God was poured out on his body and he was put inside a hole hewn in the rock and guards were posted And the next day, the tomb was open and they had made lies about how that came about. And when the women got to the tomb and saw it empty and the stone rolled back, there was an angel who said to them, and Luke records this, why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember his words when he said to you, these things would be so. When your circumstances overwhelm you and when the storms of life get too severe for your weak frame, remember the words of Christ. He has promised to sustain and preserve us in life or in death. Because if you are in Christ, the second death has no claim upon you. Our only hope is in this one who has overcome death. I pray that we look at Genesis 9 and the covenant that brings us peace with God. When we see a rainbow, we'll be reminded of the creator of all things. He's made a covenant to keep his own until that great day. Noah and his family, they could believe God because he put that beautiful bow in the sky. That's God's promise. The one who created things, the one who caused the flood, the one who killed all these people, the one who saved us. He said he ain't going to do it again. And that's his promise right there. Tonight we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Hmm. Every time you take this, as often as you take this, you proclaim his death until he comes back. His promise to us. He's coming back. Why? Because he will not lose a single sheep that God the Father has given to him. He's the faithful one. We like sheep will go astray. He is the faithful one. The ark that we're in, that one day God will shut the door will not fail, will not fail. The world can rage against us. We are secure because the ark is the Christ who has conquered death. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for revealing yourself to us in Scripture.